this very auspicious occasion, the appearance of Lord Chaitanya, the Yuga Avatar, the Golden Avatar. Um, and it's just a coincidence that I happen to be the one speaking because this is the day that I normally give a class. Otherwise, I have absolutely no qualification at all to speak on such an uh, important occasion. I have no realizations. I mean, really, that uh, I'm just a very insignificant uh, devotee. And uh, I'm not the most anything. Prabhupada used to say when devotees would say, I'm the most fallen. I'm not, you'd probably say, you're not the most anything. But maybe, maybe I'm a good close second running there. But uh, I, I, it's a great honor for me to be able to do this. It's very daunting. And I'd like to start the way Krishnadas Kaviraj uh, Goswami started, the, the uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita, the first verse, uh, is he glorifies the gurus. Yes? Is that going to fit? Vande Gurun Isha Bhaktan Isham Ishva Isham Isha Va Ta Raktan Khan Tat Praka Sams Cha Tak Da Chak Chak Da Chak Ti Krishna Chaitanya Sam Gyan Kam so the translation to that is, I offer my respectful obeisances unto the spiritual masters, the devotees of the Lord, that's all of you, the Lord's incarnations, the plenary portions, His energies, and the primeval Lord Himself, Sri Krishna Chaitanya. Ah, so that is the proper way to start the class. And then the next verse is, Vande Shri Krishna Chaitanya Nityananda Da Saho Titao Gaudo Daye Pushpavantao Chitra Sandao Tamo Nuda. It says, I offer my respectful obeisances unto Shri Krishna Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, who are like the sun and the moon. They have arisen simultaneously on the horizon of Goda. Navadweep, Mayapur, to dissipate the darkness of ignorance and thus wonderfully bestow benediction upon all. It is said that, that, that when they appeared, it was like both the sun and the moon are rising at the same time. You imagine the effulgence, the brilliance of the light that uh, would fill you know, this, 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 this place, this room, and, and, it, and enters into the hearts, uh, into the deepest, darkest regions of our innermost portion of our hearts, trying to get not only to the heart of the matter, but to the soul of the heart of the matter, because the soul is hidden within the heart of the matter. And that soul is very deep, and it down, it's been there for trillions of lifetimes, maybe trillions of kalpas and yugas. Uh, 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 obviously yugas, but who knows how long. That soul is buried down. It's like I was thinking, you know, you because uh, it talks about all the weeds within the hearts, and there's various stages of the sinful reactions and pious reactions, those that are, are presently happening to you, those that are um, about to happen, those that are uh, in a deep, uh, dark, dormant stage, and uh, there's one other stage, but you know, those, you're not even aware of them. There's dormant seeds of karmic reactions or even desires that you're not aware of that are buried deep down inside of the, our hearts. And it's like a jungle of weeds. You can imagine something like, a, you know, a, Raiders of the Lost Ark and going through the deepest, darkest part of the Amazons, slashing their way through the weeds and the, all the, the creepers and the, the serpents and vipers and big spiders and all sorts of insects. All of those things are our sinful reactions. You have to get down. And that sunlight from Krishna, Chaitanya, 
and Lord Nichananda, the moon and Lord, and Lord Chaitanya, uh, dissipate all of the clouds, all of the darkness in your deep, dark, foggy night in the middle of the ocean. No, no hope for saving. Then the clouds are parted by the sun and the moon simultaneously. And then comes the rescue boat. The, the, the Hare Krishna movement, the Hare Krishna mantra. This sound vibration creates transcendental consciousness. It awakens that soul. But then, even then, even when that's happening, the soul is covered with a mind which is like filled with, like with ghosts and, and different kinds of entities, subtle entities. Say, no, no, you don't want to go. Stay here. Stay here and we have some more enjoyment here for you. Just look at this. So many temptations, but the soul finally, now, by tasting the Hare Krishna mantra, will eventually end, cut the knot for so many lifetimes and be freed from this wicked wheel of samsara, the cycle of birth, death, old age, and disease. Just one life after another, after another, after another. There's no end to it. And it there's no real pleasure, just occasionally, just the release of anxiety for a few moments. Oh, I'm enjoying now. It's just, it's just not an anxiety. You know, I mean, I know people that say that when I'm not in anxiety, I start to get in anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not worrying about something, I, I start to worry. <laughs> Something's wrong. Um, so, uh, but I, you know, my words don't do it, uh, don't give, there's no way to adequately describe the potency of this, this process. And so this is the, the, uh, the Yuga Dharma. And, uh, the, in previous ages there's the Satya Yuga, and, um, such a yuga, because you have a very long lifetime, the, the process is through meditation, meditating for tens of thousands of years. And, and then you can achieve uh, freedom from the uh, cycle of samsara. But you don't reach the level uh, of spiritual existence as you do through this process. Maybe Vaikuntha, some place like that. Uh, the way you worship with awe and reverence. Same thing with Treta Yuga. Treta Yuga is the second age. In that age, the, the qualities of goodness and are starting, and the different qualities are starting to diminish slightly. And now it's um, huge yagyas offering, yagya by Vishnu, offering, offering to all, uh, through the fire sacrifices, praying the, the, chanting the proper mantras, and then you can. Um, Please, you know, uh, please the Supreme Personality of God, uh, Godhead, and then you can ultimately achieve uh, liberation from birth and death. But it takes lifetimes doing it this way. And then there's the Wapari Yuga, the age just prior to this one. And now things are really getting, now you're living um, less. Even in the, in the Old Testament, it says that Abraham lived up to about 800, 900 years. There's many characters, I've seen a list of the Old Testament personalities that lived 500, 700 years, 800 years. Then something happens, and in that age though, it's supposed to be temple worship, but it has to be very opulent temple worship. And even then, it's not like as, as, uh, uh, as effective as what we have now. And this is the darkest of all the ages. But you see, there's a point, something happens from the Old Testament to the New Testament, that now people are only living maybe up to 100, 125, and sometimes 80, 90s, like that. And in this age, the Yuga Dharma is Harinama, 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 Eva, Eva, Kalo, Nasteva, 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 Kapiram, Chant the holy names, chant the holy names, chant the holy names. There's no other way in this age of Kali the age of quarrel, the iron age, the golden age is such a yuga, and then silver is treta yuga, was it bronze, the dwapara yuga, and then the iron age. 
hypocrisy, quarrel, short-lived, unlucky, and above all, always disturbed. So, so this is the process, this is the Yuga Dharma. So, but there's one thing unique about this particular Kali Yuga. You know, there each this kalpas, there are four cycles, just like winter, spring, summer, and fall, and then you go into the next. So in every Kali Yuga, there is uh, the Hare Krishna movement. But only in this particular one um, is Krishna himself coming as the Yuga Avatar. In the other ages, it's mostly uh, jiv, jiv, empowered jivas who descend to distribute the Hare Krishna mantra. And this process is a very confidential process. I mean, I remember even when, when I was young, in the early 60s, I've mentioned this before, after the uh, Vatican II, I think it was, the Ecumenical Council, and so the, the Catholics decided that now it's time to forgive the Jews for the crucifixion of Jesus. And um, so we invited a rabbi to come and speak and give a homily. And he told us that he had just returned from the Holy Land. And he said that only the purest of the pure rabbis can know the name of God. And I remember I was thinking, I was, if it was 62, I was about 12 or 13 years old. And I was thinking, I'm going to find out that name. I'm going to do it. And I started, you know, that was my... First initiation. <laughs> As you were talking about just I made it I made a commitment to myself to find out what is the name of God. Of course there are many names for God. The most confidential name, the most potent name is Krishna. But uh, you know, you can chant any name of God. That is recommended. So um, anyway, so there's a there's so there's Lord Chaitanya appears because there's uh, there's two basic reasons. I mean, it's incidental that he's appearing to distribute the holy name, because that is the Yuga Dharma. But also what's going on here is, in this age, is that you might say that Krishna is having an, uh, an existential crisis. Because he's noticing that his topmost devotees, he's the supreme enjoyer. That means he's supposed to be enjoying the most. But he realizes that his topmost devotees like the gopis, you know, even, you know, I would imagine the coward boys and, and, and his, parent, uh, the, his parental, ones in parental uh, rasa, they're also experiencing so much pleasure. Now, I, and it's said that Radharani is experiencing pleasure 10 million times greater than Krishna. And Krishna's thinking, well, are we, I'm the supreme enjoyer. How come they're enjoying more than I am? And even sometimes he sees a reflection of himself in the clear marble floors. And then he's ordered in a column made of jewels. And he thinks, he's so beautiful. I wonder who that is. Yeah, I'd love to be able to embrace him. You know, so it, he's understanding that the servants, the devotees, in the topmost, most intimate relationships, the purest souls, they're experiencing more pleasure than he is by being God. Which is the irony is that the fallen souls in this material world have come here because we think by imitating, by becoming God or being controllers of this material nature, we're actually being controlled by material nature. And we, we never become master, we're always still a servant. And we don't experience pleasure. I mean, there's moments, there's, you know, and we tell ourselves, you know, there are certain points in my life where there were sort of seminal moments, and I'm thinking, this is it, finally, now I'm really going to experience, and I'm thinking to myself, this is it? This is it? I mean, it's, it's all mental, it's in your mind. So, Krishna wants to experience the pleasure of Radharani. So, in this age, he decides to descend in the mood of Radharani. He has the same color as Radharani, golden, the effulgence of Radharani, and has the mood of Radharani. So what's happening down in, uh, on the earth planet at that time, he'd already sent out 
many of his uh, devotees and even his uh, other partial um, expansions, such as Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu is a Dvaita Charya. Or a Dvaita Charya is like the age of Jagannath Mishra. So he's the one you always see with the white beard and and uh, long white hair. So this is, you know, for those people that see God as an old man, the Dvaita Charya is the one for you because he's Mahavishnu and he appears to be very old. Um, so he has a white beard, he has white hair, and he's already started preaching. He's having open Bhagavad Gita classes. He's having some success. But the place, Navadri, is it's so um, opulent in a way. It's like the... Uh, it's the center of all intellectual and philosophical, cultural uh, capital of India. And um, it's like the Cambridge, it's like the Oxford, MIT, uh, uh, you know, of today. And so there are also a lot of strange things going on. They're doing tantric yoga, they're worshipping various demigods, even some concocted things like with snakes and, and then performing trying to show off their wealth and success by having um, elaborate weddings for their daughters and when they run out of children they start doing other kinds of weddings. Uh, so they just to show off their wealth. And he's realizing, I, I need help. Adoita Char is realizing, I need help. And he, there's a loophole in the Shastra that states that if you worship Sarva Karna Karma, the cause of all causes, with Tulsi leaf and Ganga water. Then, and you pray very sincerely, very <coughs> intensely, then he will come. He will fulfill your desires. So, Adoita Acharya's desire is please, please, these people, they're short lived, they're unlucky, they're always arguing, they're quarreling. They, they're, there's hypocrisy, and they're always disturbed. Please, you must come yourself, descend here, and help us distribute the Yuga Dharma. And so, Krishna hears his prayers, and he decides that, yes, this is the age, I will descend myself. I'll do the Yuga Dharma this time. And so he arranges that on the day of his appearance, it's a full moon night. And in India, if there's an eclipse, this is considered, in the Vedic culture, extremely inauspicious. You don't want to be exposed to the diffused light of an eclipse. So they cover all their grains, they cover all the things that are, you know, whatever edibles they have, and they shut the windows tight, not to be exposed to the diffused light from the eclipse. But they all go down to the river, to the Ganges and they immerse themselves in the holy river and they chant Hari! Hari! That's H-A-R-I Hari! Hari! Now at that time it was a multicultural area there was Muslims there as well so all the Vaishnavas and the, and the Hindus are chanting Hari! Hari! This is to offset the effect of the uh, uh, eclipse but the Muslims are going Hari! Hari! What's this? Hari! Hari! Yeah, what is this? Hari, Hari! And then they found themselves doing it also. So everybody's chanting, Hari, Hari, Hari! <laughs> and around this time also it said that there was a, a young, small boy. His name was Gadadha, not related to Gadadha Pandit. And uh, he was like a little coward boy. And he goes, bursts into the king's house and says, I want to see the king. I want him... Uh, to chant Hare Krishna, I'll cut off his head. He's just a tiny little boy, he's real cute. Get the king, and the guards are like, they don't know how to, what is this boy? What is, he's, he's adorable. <laughs> he wants to cut off the king's head, and the king hears the commotion. So he, he, he's like, uh, he comes running down, he says, what's going on down here? He, see, he sees the little boy, he says, you're the king, right? He goes, yes. He said, I want you to chant Hare Krishna, or I'll kill you. <laughs> the king just got okay, son, all right, uh, you come back tomorrow and I'll chant Hare Krishna. No, you fool, I don't have to come back tomorrow, you just chanted Hare Krishna. <laughs> and he went off. So, this was what was happening at that time. 
everyone was being forced to chant the name of God. And um, so after Lord Chaitanya uh, appears, he's born under a neem tree, and so therefore the ladies call him Nimai. And uh, as an infant, uh, he would induce everyone in the village to chant Hare Krishna, because um, he would start to cry, and nobody likes to hear a baby cry. So um, they, they realize if they go, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, he'd start to, ah. <laughs> and he'd, so he stopped crying. So then they think everything's all right. Then he stopped crying again. So then they start chanting again. And this is going on like this. This is his little pastime. Like, I remember doing this with uh, the children in Atlanta. Uh, but I would, I would threaten them. Uh, I like to play like Sora's demons. And, and they knew that. So I'd say, I'm going to throw you all in a pit of rats. And I'd start to go after them. And then they knew then that if they start chanting Hare Krishna, I'd go, Stop! Stop! I can't stand it! No, stop! And then they'd chase me chanting Hare Krishna like that. And then go back and forth like that. So, this is, you know, the way you can induce children. And he, as a child, was inducing the adults. So, also another little pastime that happens when he's young is there's a Brahmin, a very pious Brahmin, who uh, is coming door, around door to door, and he has a little Gopal deity. Some of you probably know this story. Um, that, um, and uh, he comes to the house of Jagannath Mishra, and he asks Jagannath Mishra, Jagannath Mishra can immediately see that this Brahman is imbued with love for Krishna. And so, and he says, you can stay here as my guest, and what, what do you need? I said, I just need some utensils so I can cook my offering to my deity Gopa. He says, sure, no problem. So they, he starts to cook, and then as he's doing the prayers of offering, all of a sudden, from outside in the courtyard, little Nimai comes, and he's covered with dust, and he grabs a handful of the rice and starts to eat it. And the Brahmin says, oh no, no, my offering! And everybody comes running in. And he goes, the, the child is eating my offering! And, and Jagannath Mishra is furious with him, and he gets very angry. But the Brahmin sees the boy is very innocent, and you can <coughs> see he's really attracted to him. He doesn't know why, but says, please don't be angry with your boy. It's okay. It'll be all right. So I'll just, I'm used to, I'm in the forest all the time, I'll just take some fruits and roots, it's nothing. And Jagannath Mishra says, I won't hear of it. You, I'll provide you with more rice, and you cook, and I'll take care of the boy. So, he goes through the same thing again, they put him off. And while this is, he's cooking at the next offering, he's next door, uh, little Nimai, and he's with the, all the mothers. And he's telling them, well, they were asking, why did you do that? He said, I'm a coward boy. I'm used to eating the rice of the Brahmins. And they're all laughing. Oh, he's so adorable. Oh, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? And uh, um, so, because he's covered. He doesn't want anyone to know who he is. He, he is a devotee. And that is the, he is the incarnation to teach us how to be a devotee. Prophet said in Atlanta, when he saw Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, he said, Krishna came 5,000 years ago, and he said, Sarvadamam Puritta Dhamam Ekam Sarvadamam Bhutam, Hang Tvam Sarvapapi Vyo Moksha Sham Masucha. You know, you just surrender to me. Give up all other forms of rituals, and I will protect you. So, Prabhupada said that. He made that statement, but he realized that no one was understanding how to surrender. So then he decides to descend this Lord Chaitanya. There's multi-level reasonings for why Lord Chaitanya came. So he came to teach them how to surrender. But he said, Lord Krishna came 5,000 years ago demanding surrender. But in this age, he's just begging you to come take shelter at his lotus feet and chant the holy names. So, anyway, the, he starts, he's, he's cooking again, and everything, everybody thinks it's safe, and he starts to do the prayer, the offering, and um, somehow the Nimai gets in again and grabs the rice and starts eating it. And he goes, oh my God, no! And it's a big commotion, and just then, his older brother, Vishwarupa, walks in. 
Now you have to understand, Jagannath Mishra and um, and Mother Sachi had had nine daughters prior to this that had died stillbirth, and um, so not, and Vishwarupa was a very he was actually an expansion of Lord Balaram, or is an expansion of Lord Balaram, and um, very intelligent, and he was already uh, going to school. He was older than uh, Lord Chaitanya. So he comes in, and the Brahmin sees him, and, and he's immediately attracted because this is an expansion of Balaam. You can see that this is no ordinary young man. And Vishwarupa wants to know what's going on, what's the problem. Jagannath Misha is pulling his hair out, can't figure out what's going, you know, how, to, how to control Nimai. Vishwarupa says, everything will be all right, don't worry, we'll take care of this. You just go ahead and cook again. He says, I can get the fruits and the roots. No. You, I, I'll take care of everything. So now everything is locked up. He's locked up, everyone's around guarding, and he starts cooking again. It's very late now, it's getting close to midnight. So then, but everybody falls asleep. And now, it's just the Brahmin and Nimai. <laughs> and uh, he does it again. But this time, when the Brahmin sees that he's done it again, he can't believe it, and he's yelling, yelling, but everybody's deep asleep. And at that moment, look, this little boy appears as an eight-arm form of Krishna. Four arms have the conch shell, disc, club, and lotus flower. The two of the arms, one hand has butter, and the other hand is taking butter and eating, and the other two hands are playing a flute. And he says to him, you know, and he, and he, the Brahmin just like falls down and is, is quivering. He can't believe what he's seeing and is completely experiencing the highest form of Prem and Bhava, ecstasy. And, and Krishna then explains to him that in your previous life, you did this same pastime happened at the house of Nanda Maharaj, but you don't remember. So, you are a very, very pious Brahmin. You're a great devotee of mine. And I'm showing you this form, but you must promise to keep this a secret. And there's a very confidential secret that I want you to know. That I am introducing this chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra in this age. And wherever the Hare Krishna mantra is being chanted, I am there. But this is a secret. And so the Brahmin is just completely, yes, and then everything goes fine and he leaves in the morning. So around this time, also now, Vishwarupa is going to school, he's going to classes with the Doita Charyas, Bhagavad Gita classes, and he comes home one night and he hears his parents talking about making arrangements for his marriage. And uh, he doesn't want any part of that. He knows what that means, and he doesn't want to get entangled. So the very early that morning, he sneaks away, renounces family life, and becomes sannyas. So now you have to understand that Jagannath Vishnu and Mother Sachi had already lost nine daughters, and they'd lost, now they've lost Vishwarupa, they don't want to lose another son. So they decide, no school for Nimai. He will not be educated. So what happens is, Nimai becomes basically a juvenile delinquent. He starts, to him and his friends are causing havoc in the village. One day, him, one night, him and a friend of his take a blanket and cover themselves and they act like they're a bull and they start smashing the banana trees. And the people see outside, what are you doing? Hey, hey, go! Like that. So many different things. Um, uh, but so many different pastimes. But an important one is where Mother Sachi one time comes where this, everyone, they, they just have the clay pots. No plastic is being used, so everything, you know, goes back to nature. But the clay pots for cooking, after they're used, they take them and they all put them in one area. And there's uh, Nimai sitting on top of the clay pots. And it's all full of soot. And she's, and it's like a, a trash area. And not like a trash area we know, but, you know, a a biodegradable one. So, and she said, what are you doing? This is like, you're in a very moochy place and covered with smoke. And he said, 
This, these pots were used to cook for offerings to Lord Vishnu. It's a sanctified place. Besides, wherever I go, it, the, the place becomes sanctified. She goes, what? What are you talking about? Who has taught you this Mayavadi philosophy? You know, he, well, I and the pots are one. And he's going, stung. And, and her, the neighbors come out and hear this commotion and said, where, where have you gotten this from? He said, well, you don't send me to school. How else will I be educated? I don't know. And they go, oh, the neighbors said, you don't send him to school? Why? You don't have to worry about your son. He's such a sweet, and he's so, ed he's so intelligent. So check it out, Mitra, when he comes home, he's so embarrassed, he decides, okay, he can go to school. So now he's starting to go to school, and he's first class, he's amazing. In one day, the lesson, the, the teacher will give him very complicated uh, grammar lessons on Sanskrit. He understands the entire thing by the end of the day, and is perfect in it. And he starts to develop a little bit of a, an attitude. And in those days, like, you know, when I was growing up, we used to challenge each other to arm wrestling or handball, ba basketball hoops and things like that. In those days, in Navadweep, they would challenge each other to debate. It was a little bit different culture, isn't it? You know, so there are little gangs of debaters, like, mm -hmm. like the, and what's that, sort of the sharks and the jets, but, you know, there's no, <laughs> there's no switch knives or anything like that, you know. And they're not fighting over the hand of a woman, they're fighting for their intellectual prowess and their realization of the scripture. So Nehemiah's got a little following, and he's younger. So the older boys, they're thinking, they go up to Nehemiah one day, and he's followed by this, he has a little, you know, following, his little gang with him, the Nehemiah's. And um, <laughs> the older boys say, why are you so conceited? He goes, well, ask me a question. So they ask him, okay, what is verbal roots? Explain verbal roots. So he goes on this very, you know, elaborate, very intricate understanding of all the subtleties of verbal roots, and they go, wow, that's really impressive. Yeah, you, we can see, you know, you're right. No, I'm not. That's not right. <laughs> you fool. That, that, that's, not the, that's not the real definition of verbal roots. This is. And then he gives another explanation. They go, Oh, you're right. No, I'm not. <laughs> they go on like this. So he has this real attitude. And um, around this time, though, you know, meanwhile, though, the Doita Charya's group of Vaishnavas is growing, and they really would, they just, Gadadar Pandit, who actually is Radharani, uh, he's only interested in bhakti. He's not interested in all these academic things. And they just wish that he, he would be such a powerful devotee. Why doesn't he just join us? So, sometime around this day, he was 12 years old or 16 years old, I'm not sure. But his father passes away. So he goes, and, and prior to this, he had already met Ishwar Puri. Uh, Ishwar Puri knew that he was very intelligent, and there would, had been this whole thing between him and Adikvi Jai, who was very well known, and the most potent debater in all of that area. And Lord Chaitanya defeated him, but didn't humiliate him at all. So, and, you know, but the time is passing. So, um, but Ishwar Puri had given him a book that he'd written and asked him to look at it and see if there was any corrections. And, and Lord Chaitanya said, yeah, the verb in this verse here needs to be corrected. So, Ishwar Puri thanked him, he went home, he looked at it, he said, no, this is, this is fine. He goes back to Lord Chaitanya and says, there's nothing wrong with this verb. And Lord Chaitanya says, yeah, I think you're right, yeah. But he was so glad because he knew this was going to be his Diksha Guru. So now, his father passes away and he goes to Goya. And when he gets there, there's a big ceremony going on around an imprint of Vishnu's lotus feet. And there's so many garlands, it's, it looks like a, a, a temple has been built on top of the, in, uh, the uh, lotus feet of Vishnu. And there's a Brahmin glorifying Lord Vishnu's lotus feet, that these are the same lotus feet that the goddess of fortune are 
is massaging. This is the same lotus feet as the meditation, the goal of all meditation for all the, the great sages and the shelter of the universe. And something's starting to stir in Chaitanya's heart. And then at that moment, he, he sees Ishwara Puri and something is growing. He then goes back to his place where he's staying in Goya and he prepares to cook a meal. And just at that moment, Ishwar Puri walks in and Chaitanya immediately says, Here, take, take it, here, sit down and just prepare this, you eat. And Ishwar Puri says, No, nah, I've already, you know, you, you, we'll split it. You, you have half. He says, No, no, take the whole thing, I'll cook something else. So anyway, it, he develops this feeling towards him and he eventually surrenders to him, and Ishwar Puri initiates him into chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. So now he comes back from Goya and has completely changed. He's chanting, he wants, he sees every Vaishnava, can I help you with that? Can I do this? Because his goal is to teach spontaneous devotional service. That is the goal, that's the highest level, to be a spontaneous servant not conditional, not motivated. So he starts to go around asking everyone, can I help you with this, can I help you with that? And when he chants, he, he starts to ex experience symptoms that, you know, he, and he's thinking, maybe I'm going crazy. So he goes back to Ishwar Puri, I said, there's something wrong with the mantra. You, you, you gave me, I, I, I'm having these symptoms. And he said, no, that's bhava, your prema, that you're experiencing ecstasy. So, now he's got this group of people, and they start this what's called nocturnal, um, nocturnal kirtans at Shivas, Shivas Thakur's house at night. Yeah, nocturnal. They chant all night, and it, you only can be, and it's locked. You know, it's not members only. Even one time, young one young Brahmin boy comes to the house and, and begs to come in, and um, he says, "Well." Shiva says, well, I'm, he's, what's your qualification? I'm a, a, a born in a Brahmin family, I practice this, I do that, and I just drink milk, that's all I do. And so he comes in the house, and as they start the kirtan, Lord Chaitanya says, there's something wrong, someone here is not completely pure at heart. And then he says, well, this is new Brahmin, he, says, he, just, he just drinks milk. Well, that's not a qualification, if that's true, <laughs> then all the babies can come in here. So they ask him to leave, and, but the Brahmin doesn't care. I've seen the golden one dancing. He's so pleased as he's walking down the road. I don't care. I got to see Lord Chaitanya, the golden one, dancing. And um, because Lord Chaitanya is omniscient, he's the super soul within the heart, he immediately understood the, that his heart had changed, and he calls him back. <coughs> So after one year, and by the way, it was a nocturnal, they chant all night, but then they were so enlivened by the spiritual potency of the chanting that they, uh, they worked all day. So for one year, they didn't sleep. They chanted all night and did their services all day. So after a year now, it's time to go out into the public and start the chanting in the public. And you have to also understand is that the Hare Krishna mantra, it says that anyone who's chanted the Hare Krishna mantra, even if it's a derisive, a kind of, hey, Hare Krishna, um, that means that they have performed all the rituals that is required in the Vedas, all of the, the, the tapasyas, all the austerities. They've studied all the scriptures because that only one who has done that has, has the qualification to say Hare Krishna. Say, Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Say, you're okay. <coughs> so, they start chanting in the streets and blissful kirtans. But it's not so much the Muslims. The Muslims make fun of them. The Muslims go, ah, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. But they can't stop chanting once they start making fun of them. They go, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, I don't know what I'm doing, I keep saying Hare Krishna. And uh, Hare Krishna. So, um, but the Brahmins, the Hindus, no. 
They're like the Pharisees. I mean, they're smart, the Brahmins. This is not right. He's got untouchables. He's got sudras. They're not the proper caste. This is a, a sacred mantra. They shouldn't be chanting this mantra. Just like as I mentioned, only the purest rabbi can know the name of God. And he's letting this, <laughs> he's letting the most confidential knowledge out, opening up the storehouse of love of God in and distributing it to everyone. So everyone is chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So the Brahmins go to the Kazi and say, you must stop this man. He's ruining our religion. This is against our scriptures. So they, and they actually say um, that by this act of having the low class sujas, vaishas, and even women chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, he's ruining the potency of the mantra will be lost. Of course, when Prabhupada heard that in a play, he said, but, the, but it's already increased. And then he goes like this, and the whole temple room is filled with devotees. And they're all going, Haribo! Haribo! So, um, the Kazi doesn't know what to do, so he sends out the police, and they, they get violent, and they grab one of the Madungas, and they smash it. So this outrages Lord Chaitanya, and he organizes a huge kirtan. And you can also... As I, I forgot to mention, that even at the time of his appearance, the demigods were coming from higher plants to come and see the baby, to come and see the Lord. And when the kirtans are going on, they're also there. Maybe not visible to everyone else, but all the residents of the heaven plants, they're all coming. Narada Muni, all of these people are coming to see and to participate. Prabhupada used to say that would happen. Sometimes, they, one time they had a, a program they organized, I think it maybe in Boston, New York, and it was a big auditorium, maybe a couple of people showed up. And so the devotees were apologizing, Prabhupada, I'm sorry, no one came. He said, what do you mean no one came? Narada Muni was there, this one was there. Yeah. You didn't see? You know, anyway, Prabhupada would say, no one's there, you preach to the walls. Because the atoms, the, all the, the living entities within the atoms, all of them benefit by the sound vibration. The sound vibration is so potent, it purifies the whole atmosphere and it spreads out around all that area. Uh, so, uh, so they have a big civil disobedience. The beginning of civil disobedience was in Gandhi. It was Lord Chaitanya. Peaceful, non-violent. Now, this, this is the other distinction between Krishna... Um, Lord Ch Krishna Chaitanya and all the other incarnations of the Lord. In, this incar in those other incarnations he comes and he has no problem you know, killing the Asuras, the non-devotees, to relieve the burden of the, of the earth planet. But they get liberation when they're killed by God. But in this age he does not kill with weapons. He kills with love. He distributes love of Godhead. This is a peaceful, non-violent movement, and the, the Hare Krishna mantra is the weapon. So, they, they, there's tens of thousands, and sometimes I've heard hundreds of, a hundred thousand or more people coming, and they're marching on the Kazi's house, and he's completely, he's shaking, he doesn't even have a, a force, police force big enough to protect him. So, He's hiding in his house, turns off all the lights, and they're all like standing outside, really loud, Kirtan, Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Kazi, come out. So finally, Lord Chaitanya stops them and he approaches the house and he induces the Kazi to come out and speak to him. He said, Don't worry, everything will be okay here. These people are with me, you have nothing to fear. So he asked him, Why did he stop the Kirtan? And he explains, It's because the Brahmins. Your own people told me that this was against your religious principles. And they have a nice philosophical discussion. And then, but then he, uh, Lord Chaitanya pursues the Lord Moises, but you didn't stop us after that. Why, why didn't you stop us? He said, 
Well, I'll tell you, but I only tell you. I don't want anyone else to know. He said, no, no, you don't have to worry. Everyone here is my friends. He said, well, the night, the night after, the, my, um, the police force went out and broke the drums. I had a dream. It was a half lion, half man, Lushinga mm -hmm. Dev, came to me and pounced on my chest. And he said, if you dare, I mean, but not like the way I'm saying it, you know, if you dare stop the chanting parties that are chanting the holy name, Krishna, I will kill you, your family, and all the meat eaters. And then his, his hand with nails swipes his chest. And when he wakes up, he, he actually sees the marks of nails on his chest and blood is dripping down. And he shows that. And he said, and look, see, here's the, the skull. And he shows the Lord and everyone's aghast and amazed. So, this movement is the Yuga Dharma. It is the process that will uh, ultimately inundate this world with um, the highest form of love of God, save us from this very um, entangled jungle that we find ourselves in. There's no way out. You can't, you can't just be a good person. It's not good enough. You have to develop pure love of God. The way to do it in this age is through the chanting of the holy names. Of course, you can also pray, and you can worship the, so many, you know, the nine different processes. But we encourage everyone at this time of the year, at this particular time, on this appearance day of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, to try to understand, because it, as was stated yesterday, Jamma Kama Jame Divyam, Evam Yogati Tattvata, Chakva Deham Puna Jamma, Naiti Mam Itti Sojuna. Anyone can understand the purpose of my appearance and disappearance, they can become free from the suffering that they're experiencing in samsara. So, this is the Yuga Dharma, and there's an esoteric meaning to why he has appeared in this age. So we have to understand it philosophically, read the scriptures, don't be sentimental, uh, Religion without philosophy is dry sentiment mentality. And philosophy without religion is uh, dry mental speculation. There's a combination here. We have the Shastras, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Bhagavad Gita, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, the Nekya Devotion, the Sri Shapanishad, and we have the Hare Krishna Mantra, the dancing, the, uh, and the association, and of course we have Prashad, but later today, we're fasting. Anyway, so is anything someone would like to say? <coughs> Nothing? How about, does anyone want to say Hare Krishna? Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! <laughs> so anyway, I, I hope uh, something I Question? said... Question? Yes? And, um, yeah. So maybe you could speak a little bit about like so you, you, you talked about the importance of chanting um, the Maha Mantra, um, but uh, may, maybe you could speak a little bit about you know <coughs> uh, chanting other bona fide names of God and how that's also yeah. That's not, not a problem. Yeah, sure. There's no problem with that. Prabhupada said at my initiation ceremony when I uh, when I was getting my first initiation, he had uh, Kirtananda speak on the Ten Offenses. And um, he said, Kirtan said, you can chant any name of God. And then Prabhupada said, any bona fide name of God. Now, you just can't make up a name of God. You can say, chant a, a bona fide name of God. So, we encourage people. And of course, Allah is not exactly a name of God. I know they say Allah Akbar, God is great. It means, that's a title. But, I mean, I, I'm, so, I'm sure it's a pious thing to well, do. Yeah, 
in, in the Quran that there are 99 different names. Names, so there are names. Yeah. So, and and, and it's, it's similar to how Prabhupada says actually that Krishna is not even really Krishna's name, rather it's just a... It's, it's a description. It's a description. So it, similarly, the 99 names of Allah are also a description. Exactly, yeah. Because there is no name for God, really. It's just, like, Krishna just means the all-attractive one. Uh, and But it's the, you know, most potent name. It's like, if you chant Vishnu a thousand times, it equals once Krishna. If you chant Rama three times, it equals one Krishna. But still, any bona fide name of God, and they're going to go, and so many different names in other traditions. And I actually brought three monks who were Trappist monks into see Srila Prabhupada in Atlanta. And um, they were doing what they call Japa Yoga. And there's a tradition in Christianity, it's a very, very esoteric, rare um, uh, school. Of, um, and there's a monastery actually somewhere in the Middle East where they simply, just as John the Baptist, he was saying, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And Prabhupada had already said in Australia with the Franciscan monks that when they found out what St. Francis was preaching, that, you know, he said, brother, sun, sister, moon, you know, brother, brother, owl, sister, sparrow, whatever. It, it's these, it, that his, St. Francis saw God everywhere and probably said, oh, this is real God, not just this. And then Prabhupada said, you know, Christ, means the anointed one, comes from Christos, Christ, Christos, Krishna, the anointed one. So all the monks were completely um, overwhelmed with Prabhupada's surrender, his appreciation of St. Francis, and so they all began to chant. They were chanting Christos, and we, the boys were chanting um, Krishna, and it became almost like as if they were chanting Krishna too, but they were saying Christos, Christ. But Jesus is the Son of God. And when I brought these men in, these three monks, they said, I said, because I had just read about this incident in Australia, so I thought, well, Prabhupada's going to really like this. They were chanting on their rosaries, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And Prabhupada said, where in the Bible it says that Jesus is God? I mean, because in the, in, the in the Old Testament, in Genesis, it says, uh, uh, in, um, in the beginning of creation, uh, what is it? In the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was God. And God and His name are non-different. So, hallowed be thy name. So, they would, so but Prophet was, his point was, is that God, not the Son. We don't disagree that Jesus is not the Son of God. He is an, a Shaktavesh avatar, an empowered just like I mentioned earlier, that the um, in other Kali Yugas, Krishna doesn't come, and empowered Jiva comes, a Shakta Avatar. So I, I'll, I see your hand. Okay, just hold on. My wife has got her, her say. So um, then, but the Son of God and the Father are one in love and in purpose. But in Jesus of Christ. Christos, Christ, you know, the, the anointed one. So, Christos, yes. But Jesus is the Son. It's like me just chanting Prabhupada, Prabhupada, Prabhupada. It's not the same effect. So what is it coming? Um, uh, one of his disciples said, you, you are so good. I guess I'm just, it's a little, not quite right. But Jesus said, um, why do you call me good? Because only God is good. Yeah, he would, he, he would sort of like when Lord Chaitanya, Pete the Bodhis would say, you know, you are, you are Vishnu, you are Krishna. Didn't want to hear that, because he was playing the part of a devotee. Jesus Christ didn't um, encourage his followers to call him the Father, or call him God. He, but he was obviously... Um, doing God's work. He was obviously from, sent down from the uh, spiritual uh, planets to come and elevate the fallen souls. But he was preaching to people at time, place, and circumstance. 
you know, um, so everything is adjusted according to that. Yes? Was, um, well, he, he already, you let him say one Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, no, please. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Uh, so when, when, when he said that, when he made that point. Who? Uh, said what? When Christ made that point that uh, uh, he didn't want to be identified as God, uh, he, they said, so how, his disciples said, so how should we pray? And he said, our Father. Our, our, oh, Lord, really? Yes. Our Father who art in heaven, yeah. hallowed be thy name. Exactly. Interesting. I mean, there's Yahweh. I mean, there's also... A bit, what does Osana mean? They're always saying Osana at the churches. Osana. Oh, glory. Oh. Glory, That's uh, glory in the highest. Glory in the highest. Yeah, so I, I think that's kind of a name. Um, no. No? Okay. But I, I know there are uh, some one devotee presented to Prabhupada different names that are there in the Bible referring to God. What was that? I just said it, uh, but you said no. Name Jehovah? Jehovah, yeah, Yahweh. Yeah, so Elohim. you got a point. Elohim. Yeah, I was just going to say um, something maybe we can, you know. Uh, Say that maybe Jesus what was not the Father, or, you know. Some people may say, yeah, actually he was the Father. And, um, anyway, but regardless, uh, even if he, he isn't the Father, isn't it true that if we glorify the pure devotee of the Lord, that it's also yes. I guess basically a form of kirtan in a sense, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. We we glorify Shri Prabhupada. Right. You have to glorify your spiritual master, and Jesus Christ is your spiritual master. You're very fortunate to have a bona fide spiritual master, but you should follow. What? He's as good as God. He's as good as God. That's, Prabhupada told us, he taught us, we sing every morning, Shakshaladitre mm Nasamasu -hmm. that you are uh, as good as God, God. We worship you as if you, uh, God would come, because he's the ambassador from God. Just like if you know, the example Prabhupada always gave, that if uh, I was the ambassador to the United States and I went to Peru, they would treat me as if the entire, like the President, the Congress, the people of America has come, but knowing that I'm their representative. So when the spiritual master comes, that purely representing God and his teachings, without changing, like a mailman, doesn't add anything, doesn't subtract anything, he should be treated as good as God. He should be worshipped as good as God, but don't call him God. Because that's an offense to him. He's not God. Uh, but, um, but at the same time, and sometimes they have to piecemeal it. Like Prabhupada taught us certain things, but it was a lot when he said, but later on, he said, if I told you everything you're supposed to know, you'd collapse, you'd faint. You can't handle all the rules and regulations that are involved in deity worship. We've gotten a very scaled down version like, you know, and it used to bother Prabhupada because when the devotee, he, he goes across the ocean with nothing, has two heart attacks. Everyone tells him he's crazy. He goes to the land, you know, no money from a poor country, an old man, and he's telling them, give up meat eating, give up illicit sex, give up intoxication, give up gambling, and chant... Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, 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 Hare Hare. It's impossible, they'll never listen to me. But let me try it anyway. So, he did that, he f makes devotees from the, in the land of the Malachas, nobody else would go, and then when they finally brings them over to Mayapur, and they're worshipping deities, they notice that on Lord Chaitanya, there's a peacock feather. And that's what they noticed. Not that these people are now, you know, offering their food, vegetarian food, mind you, not engaging in illicit sex life, not taking intoxication, not gambling, and they're chanting Hare Krishna, rising early in the morning, doing all these things, living, giving up the comforts that they have in America, um, and coming to this, you know, third world part of, you know, it was very remote, it was just grass huts. Lots of mosquitoes and uh, rats, and um, but the rats, but there's definitely cobras. And um, 
it was, I mean, when I went in 75, it was pretty rugged. And, um, but you just, you just didn't, you didn't think of that. You know, you, I mean, yeah, you get sick, but you just, all of a sudden, you just get so overwhelmed with this ex, um, ecstatic feeling. You're just willing to, I'll, I, I'm, I'm willing to pay any price, any price. I want more of this. There's nothing else I got in America, in, in the West, is the same. Whether it's America or Europe or South America, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's not, Australia, it doesn't matter. Nobody's offering, nobody has anything like this. And, and it's completely transcendental. So I was going somewhere with this. <laughs> the peacock. Oh, the peacock feather. So they thought that was a, that proved they weren't really devotees. Because peacock feather should only be on Krishna, and Lord Chaitanya is playing the part of a devotee, and so you shouldn't put a, a peacock feather on Lord Chaitanya. That was the, their takeaway. <laughs> After everything that Prabhupada did, their takeaway was that. Prabhupada authorized the peacock feather on Yeah, I know, he did. He's <laughs> just because of that. Really? Just because of that? Well, not just because of that, but, you know, we don't do it here. Uh, do we not? I don't, well, I don't know, do we? No. No. So, so, there are peacock feathers in a box below Chaitanya. Yeah, but we don't use it that often. Yeah. You so, can't, but, you know, it's these are the technicalities. It's the, I'm trying to point out that it's like, you know, it's just the technicality. It's the essence of the thing. Actually, Prabhupada said that Jesus Christ was our guru. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That, that um, Lord Chaitanya, before he took sannyas, he sometimes manifested pastimes in the mood of Krishna, in one of his incarnations. Yeah. And he sometimes told people on Krishna, yeah. but he covered it so they couldn't understand it. But he sometimes said that openly. So I think we worship him before, in the deity form, before he took sannyas. So it's probably wouldn't be anything like yeah. that. But they, they were wrongly complaining. Because I actually, because I, I think I mentioned that, you know, the Atlanta deities, the deities in Atlanta were the first from Mayapur, from Navadri, Gordon Thai deities. So really, in the, before that, there were paper mache deities and stuff. But, they, had, they would burn up, so Prabhupada didn't stop it. And then uh, Balavanta arranged for those deities to come, and that was their first Pujari. So I said, well, let, he sh and I was a Brahmacharya at the time, so he should be dressed like a sannyasi. And I bought saffron cloth and silk and everything. <laughs> and then Prabhupada said, no, he should be dressed like a prince. He said specifically like the Renaissance princes. The women loved it, but I was... Wasn't too happy about it. I had to top a bag. I was thinking about it too, but you know, anyway. You didn't say it, but you mean dressing more Chaitanya that way. Well, I was a Brahmacharya, and I wanted him to be dressed as a as a, as a sun dressing, yeah. But Prabhupada said, no, he should be dressed like a prince. There's no, you know, the thing is, is that. There's only similarities, there's no differences. If you want to find differences, you can, you know. But it's unity in diversity. That's the highest form of knowledge. There's unity in diversity, just like all of this. And, and like, I want to point out something. I, you know, I was thinking about this. I hear this regularly, you know, like at the Sunday piece, someone mentioned that what we need is a really strong Satya leader. And that's what will say, you know, get things going. And I was thinking about it, and I said, no, no. Well, we already have a strong leader. It's Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Swami Srila Prabhupada. What we need is cooperation. That requires some... That's a swear word. <laughs> that requires humility, tolerance, and respect. We need cooperation. There's nothing wrong with the people that are trying to do things, whether they're, it doesn't, you, if you're a manager, it doesn't, uh, that's also a service. There's no, a manager is just an, a bigger server, they, not a bigger, he's, he's, that's his service. You want that service, okay, you, you're just asking for trouble, believe me. I, I, I've been a, a temple manager and I don't think there's enough money that you could pay me that I would do, well maybe. 
but <laughs> I, I take it and then run uh, See, make a bigger t- community. But um, no, it's it's a it's service. It's all about service and cooperation. Prabhupada said, the test of your love for me after I leave it will be your ability to cooperate. I don't know what it takes, what it, it, when we will not hear this and understand this and act on this. It's not about who's in charge. It's about how we cooperate. Mm-hmm. It's like well, it's a lazy man's way of saying. I just we just needed some big charismatic leader who's going to change everything, make us all want to do things. No, make yourself do it. Mm-hmm. Inspire yourself. Read Prabhupada's books. Chant good rounds. Krishna will inspire from within. Sorry if I'm getting angry. It's the New Yorker in me. Anyway, anything else? Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Have a good night.